7.34 p.m. It is Tuesday, August 30th, 2022. Um, good evening. My name is Christian Klein, and I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, first, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. So members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Uh, Daniel Rigardelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Ben Holly. Here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, from the town, uh, we have Rick Valorelli. He's our board administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Rick. And um, I believe Vincent Lee may be with us as well. He's our assisting staff. Yeah. Ben, I am. Good to have you here with us as well. And then um, she can be in it. Checking for uh, uh, different cases this evening. Um, appearing on behalf of 24 Grandview Road, do we have uh, Ryan and Devin Thomas? Here. Perfect. Thank you. Um, appearing for 12 Prospect Avenue, John and Althea Yakimides. Here. Thank you. Um, appearing for, for 49 Valentine Road, Elizabeth and Brian Crowley. See you guys in the camera there. Hi. Um, hey. Uh, appearing on behalf of 33 Barnum Street, um, Jennifer Cardetino. Yeah, here. Thank you. Have you. Uh, appearing for 101 Robbins Road, Lauren Duddy. Here. Have you. Um, and then the last case is 60 Highland Avenue. Um, there's no one appearing for 60 Highland Avenue. They have requested to withdraw. Um, so if anybody is on the call specifically for 60 Highland Avenue, uh, we will not be discussing that this evening. With that, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into law on July 16, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> as the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotony, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples, from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. That, uh, moving to our agenda, brings us up to item number two, which is uh, approval of meeting minutes. Um, <clears throat> 
the story this evening with administrative items. These items relate to the operation of the board and as such will be conducted without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. After the introduction of each item, I'll invite members of the board to provide any comments, questions, or motions they may have. And if members wish to engage in discussion with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself for the record. Uh, so first up, as I said, is item number two, which is the approval of the written minutes for the August 9th, 2022. Uh, these were prepared by uh, Rick Valarelli and distributed to the board for comment. Um, are there any further comments that anyone from the board wishes to submit to Mr. Valarelli? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, to everyone's relief, I'm not going to make a comment that requires a change, but I wanted to express my gratitude that we got these minutes so quickly after the meeting. I usually find myself unable to remember very much about the meetings that when the, there's a long delay and getting getting the meetings out quick, the minutes out quickly is a great help. Thank you. Uh, with that, may I have a motion to approve? approve the minutes from September 9, 2022. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this will be a roll call vote of the board to approve the minutes from September 9, 2022. Uh, Roger DuPont. Uh, aye. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to item number three in our agenda, which is the approval of the decision for 1315 Adams Street. Uh, this was a case that was on the August 9th docket. Uh, the decision, the written decision was prepared uh, by our own Pat Hanlon, distributed to members of the board for comments and a final draft was issued later this afternoon uh, for final review by the board. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 1315 Adams Street? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the written decision for 1315 Adams Street as um, supplied this afternoon? So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this will be a vote of the board to approve the written decision for 1315 Adams Street. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Rickard Kelly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. That, that written decision is approved. Uh, that brings us to the end of the administrative items on our agenda this evening. So now turning to the public hearings on tonight's agenda, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves members of the board, ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. With that uh, brings us to item number four on our agenda this evening, evening excuse me, which is docket number 3705-24 Grandview Road, um, which is a continuance from the August 9th hearing. Um, this is a request for a variance. Uh, so ask the <clears throat> applicant to please introduce himself. And um, so to bring us up to speed, I don't know if you have made any um, Changes or adjustments since we last had our a hearing on the ninth. Nope, no changes or adjustments. Okay, thank you. So this is the application package. Uh, I just want to go ahead. There, what I'm looking for. So this is the site plan, um, <clears throat> Grandview Road and Spring Avenue. Um, and this is the location of the proposed carport. Uh, so there was there were a couple of questions at the end of the hearing last time, and uh, we had an opportunity to speak with, um, with the building inspector and with town council. Um, so at the time 
the House was, a, there was a question as to whether or not this is a legal front yard parking space um, because the town does not allow the establishment of parking spaces, but that was only enacted at some point, I believe in the 1960s and the House predates that. Uh, so the board does not have any documentation that indicates whether or not this was used as a driveway prior to the um, enactment of that change to the zoning bylaws. Uh, so um, it's just information we don't have. We don't know um, what that is. Uh, the other question which I had talked to council about in particular was in regards to um, the, natures of, the nature of hardship. So this is a variance application. Um, so variances have four specific criteria that all four have to be met and that's under state statute. That's not a local uh, bylaw. And what the, the second one has to deal specifically with a hardship. And so in talking with, with council, uh, he directed me towards, um, <clears throat> excuse me, certain precedents of state law in regards to this question. And the nature of the hardship relate, is to relate directly to um, issues of the site and issues of the building and not to the specific, um, the specific needs of the individual owner at the time of the request. Uh, variances are permanent changes to the, uh, to the uh, registry of the property. And therefore they are, uh, the board is not to make a decision whereby the board is looking at a specific applicant's needs relative to the, the application that they are supposed to be looking at it as a, um, basically, you know, is there something of the land that is preventing full use of the property? And so um, that was that was the advice that I was was given um, in relation to to both both applications that are our variances that are before the board this evening. So the request that is made, um, and I will back up to it. Um, so this is the special permit criteria. That's right, I forgot it doesn't have the, the correct criteria. Um, Second, apologize. So these are the variance criteria. Um, the, the first is to describe the circumstances relating to soil conditions, shape, or topography, which especially affect the land or structure in question, but do not affect generally the zoning district in which the land or structure is located. That would substantiate the granting of a variance. Uh, number two is describe how the literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning ordinance relating to the circumstances, especially affecting the land or structure in question, would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner. Um, and note that number two, hardship must relate to the circumstances of the lot as described in one. Three, describe how desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. And number four, describe how desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington. So uh, with those, we'll open this to the board. Are there questions um, that any of you have for the applicant at this time?
Seeing Mr. none. I wonder, Mr. Chairman, if the applicant could just yeah. quick, quickly go through and say what his view is as to how he meets all of these requirements. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mr. Thomas? Yes, looking at number one, uh, the property area in question is bounded by uh, some extreme topography, uh, up to 12 feet in elevation changes from there across the property uh, with the ledge outcropping right there. And then there's a bit of a wall that's been built and then mature trees on that edge. Uh, there's no access to the rest of the property due to kind of an elevated fronting there with about a three foot raised uh, front yard off the sidewalk. So this is the only part of the property that's accessible. Uh, Let's see, it is, yeah, it's the only part that's accessible. So I think that's the answer to question number one. Uh, for number two, okay. we talk about uh, the stone outcrop, you know, the example they give there is exactly what's happening here. I am bounded, this area is the only flat spot of my, uh, my lot that is able to be built upon that's currently in use already as a, a, a driveway, if you will. And then, uh, Desirable relief. Uh, again, it, the access will be off of the existing kind of driveway into the garage at the bottom of the, the, the single car garage at the bottom of the house. And we're asking to be able to put the, the carport over that, not a full garage. Um, we're happy with a, a tight restriction or a tight relief indicating it can only be a carport. And then, uh, yeah, how it may, may be granted is obviously allowing the carport to proceed, even though it is a, a, a variation on a non-conforming uh, property as it is. I probably put it a bit more eloquently in uh, my application, but I, I don't have it all at this time. Rick, by any chance do you have access to that? Um, access to what, Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry. Did, did the applicant provide the, the, I don't, for some reason, I can't find in my records the variance criteria sheet that was uh, written up by. Yeah, I, I believe. Um, the applicant. I believe that both the special permit and. I'm sure if that was something you had access to. Mr. Chairman. Um, I do yes. have it actually, I believe. Oh. I just clicked on something that purported to be it. And now I have to make sense okay. of, here we go. Um, I will stop I sharing to, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, let me, if I need to figure out how this is gonna work. Hold on a second, I'm not. Um, okay, share screen. So if I click that, that should be the right thing. And then I click here, application for a variance, click share. And with any luck, that's what you all see. Perfect, thank you. I believe if you scroll down, we, we should be able to access the uh... Okay, let me, I guess I'm the one who's in charge of scrolling down. So the um, criteria are here. So number one is the one that uh, we started with about the steep outcrop and so forth. Okay, reading number two. Okay. okay, but I guess here the, the hardship is, is updated given the example to show a like a physical uh, limitation hardship.
And also to add to number to number three, I do have unanimous support from uh, all my neighbors. Unless they've called in this time to protest on this one. Are there any further questions from the from the board? Seeing none, I will go ahead and um, open this hearing for public comment. Uh, public Questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make current to please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host to be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, the public comment period will be closed. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to address the board in regards to this matter, which is uh, 24 Grandview Road? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Without being a member of the public, I wonder if it's appropriate for me to stop screen sharing now. Um, sure. There you go. Thank you. Once going twice, 24 Grandview Road. Seeing none, I will close the public comment period uh, uh, for this hearing. Um, <clears throat> so the issue before the board, uh, the question before the board is sort of on the, almost the highest point um, in the neighborhood, the land, uh, generally slopes away from this property, um, but the property is higher than the street um, and is Excuse me, cannot Mr. be Chair? accessed um, directly off of Grandview Road as the purposes for which they are seeking um, uh, covered parking. They have an existing space in, in the front yard that they've been using uh, for parking. And so the question before the board is, are the criteria for variance met in regards to um, the uh, erection of a uh, carport in that position? Mr. Hanlon, if you wouldn't mind sharing that again. Okay, let's see if I can do. Somebody just entered the room. Um, bear with me, I have to figure out how to do this. There we go, share screen. Um, application for variance, share. You could scroll up to criteria number one. So where the board is required to make um, specific findings on all four of these criteria, um, in, the, in the past, we have sort of done sort of a straw poll fashion of going by each criteria. Um, and I, Mr. Hanlon, I don't know, does that seem like an appropriate method to do again this evening? Or do you think we should be taking an individual vote on the individual portions? I think that it, it's my view that it would be safer mm -hmm. to take an individual vote. I know that I, in the past I've had a, a, a different view um, and I'm still concerned with how this works, but my understanding of the regulations under which we operate when we're virtual is that all of the decisions we need, we, we make need to be made by a roll call vote. And I think that it's 
would be better form in light of the rules on virtual meetings for us to treat what we say about each one of these conditions uh, as if it was a determination. I think the reason for that ultimately is that uh, is to make certain that that we're all together on on the, the on the reason for the final vote. So I think that we should just discuss each one of them and then take a quick roll call vote. Um, people who changed their mind could always move to reconsider. But Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dupont. Yeah. So before we get started, Mr. Dupont. Yeah. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay. Um, before we get started going through the separate criteria, I would like to sort of clarify what it is that is being requested for the variance, because I, I'm not sure if it's a setback variance request or if it's a different type of uh, request, because I think after the last meeting, I looked at this, and for one thing, and I think maybe this would present a question for Mr. Valorelli, but you know, in the bylaw, carport is defined as a roof structure unenclosed on two or more sides for the shelter of motor vehicles. And so a motor vehicle is not defined in the bylaw, but I do think it's uh, you know, a common usage, a common term, so I think it's understood. But I'd like to know from Mr. Valorelli if carports are typically uh, okay for, for use of other than motor vehicles. Historically, has that been the case in town? Uh, Mr. DuPont, Mr. Yeah, Mr. DuPont, uh, good question. I have never seen a carport used for anything um, but a car. I suppose that there are cases around town uh, where they are used for something other than a car. So what the applicant is asking for is basically a garage in the front yard setback uh, needs a variance to um, pursue that. And, and so thank you for that. But also when you look at garage, and, and I'm not suggesting that people don't use garages for all manner of things, um, but in the bylaw garage is also defined as for keeping of a motor vehicle. And, and so I guess I have a little bit of concern that the terms of the application aren't entirely clear. And, and I'd like to go on the record saying that I don't, I don't know as I could do a better job than the applicant has done already, because I do think that this is a confusing area. Variances I think are confusing in and of themselves. And then I think when you start sort of parsing the you know, the terms in the bylaw, it gets even a bit more confusing because in the accessory use, uh, accessory storage section of the bylaw, which is 5.4.3, and it says accessory uh, recreational trailer is okay for accessory storage, but not in the front yard. So I guess I'm a little bit torn in terms of how to view this. I mean, if we're looking at it as a garage or say a carport, then we're looking at something that's there for storage of a motor vehicle. And if we're looking at it as accessory storage, then we're looking at it in terms of, yes, you can use a recreational trailer, but not in the front yard. But I don't think that that's a request that's being made in this application for a variance that somebody is saying, I'd like a variance from the recreation, the accessory storage uh, provision with regard to being able to store a uh, recreational trailer in the front yard, if I haven't garbled that too much. But I, I just think that the application is unclear and I have a hard time then sort of moving on to the criteria because I don't know what it is that we're being asked to consider and I don't find fault with the applicant for that because I think it's a sort of a torturously worded situation as far as that goes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I can, uh, continue uh, Mr. DuPont's question? I think I can take it one step further. Yes, sir. If the board uh, chooses to uh, grant this, then uh, that should be a condition that Mr. DuPont raised that only this type of vehicle X can be stored 
uh, under that carport. I don't know if that helps you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I've, uh, I've followed, I've, I've actually did the same sort of thing that Mr. DuPont did. Um, and it, it seems to me that, that both, there is a distinction in the bylaw between a, a garage and a carport. Um, the difference is that the carport must be open on at least two sides. Uh, it's one of those definitions that when you do a search through the document is never again used. Um, but whatever it is, it seems like it has to be something that shelters a motor vehicle. When you look at some of the definitions of trailers of different kinds, and including the one for a boat trailer, which is obvious about this, it's clear mm -hmm. that a thing that you that you you that you use another motor vehicle to pull doesn't count as a motor vehicle. Uh, whereas, obviously, if you had something that was on top of a of a pickup truck, for example, so that it was part of the vehicle, maybe it would be. Uh, or if it was an RV, for example, that was uh, a combined unit, it was, was the motor vehicle. But somehow having motorized transportation seems to be an essential part of what both a trailer and a carport are. And is now I'm not sure that I actually know what we what we know so far is that this has been described to us as a trailer. I, I assume that it, it is not self-propelled um, and therefore you're looking at some other kind of accessory use. So it seems to me that apart from whatever we can say about the fact that it's being used, that there are two different things that are going on here. One is the thing that everybody was originally focused on, which is uh, that this is a, a violation of the minimum yard uh, the setback requirement. Um, but also there's the question that Mr. DuPont is focused on in that we, this is an accessory structure of some kind. We know that. I think we know that it doesn't shelter a motor vehicle, which means it's not a garage or a carport. Um, and then the question is, what are the rules about what it is? And Mr. DuPont did point out that that's not supposed to be in a front yard. Uh, and and what a variance analysis would look like, assuming that that is variable. In other words, I'm assuming that that's a structural thing rather than a use thing. Um, and that could be something that we could uh, address as well. Just as one final note, the staff, the staff report was on this, the planning department report was based to some extent on the notion that for all practical purposes, Spring Avenue uh, is not really, I mean, it's technically a front, the, that area is technically a front yard, but as a practical matter, when you look at it, it's, it's buried around to the side and it functions as though it were a side yard. And so it was very important to staff in terms of deciding whether there is a, that whether there is a uh, adverse effect on the neighborhood that, if you applied the rules that normally apply as to, as a side yard to um, the Spring Avenue side, uh, that the proposal all complies with that. Uh, and so I'm sort of wondering whether that sort that, I mean, that's what, whether that is the key to a separate analysis of the factors that focus in on the type of the structure uh, rather than just on the fact that it's in a in a uh, regulations uh, front yard, I have to apologize. It's not like I have an answer to this. I'm I'm quite perplexed as to how not just what to do, but but how to how to analyze it. Uh, and it does seem to me that. I have some problem with the fact that this is causing us, or causes me at least, so much difficulty wrapping my mind about what it is that is happening, where, as a matter of fact, the, the, 
the, the substance of what's happening is, is a very minor thing. It's basically taking parking that's already happening that will continue to happen no matter what we do. And the only question is whether you erect something that looks like a carport over it to provide shelter uh, or, or, or whether you, you don't on a street which is only sort of technically a, a front yard. So it's, uh, it, it, it's a lot of mental effort to address a problem that, that somebody under the age of 12 would be able to resolve much more quickly. Well, from my, my perspective, the, um, the criteria to me that sort of causes the most, um, the most issue and the one I'm, I'm least clear on is uh, number four, is how it can be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw. Because what, what's being requested is, you know, a permanent shelter to be constructed in a step back where, which, yeah, obviously requires a variance, but it's also being requested in order to um, shelter a trailer, which, as Mr. Dupont pointed out, is not supposed to be stored in the front yard to begin with. So, it, and, you know, I say that understanding that there really is nowhere else on this site to store said trailer, um, because it, it would be a substantial effort to carve out a piece of property where this trailer could legally be stored on the on the site and that's part of the reason that's why the request is being made for the carport in this location and it's sort of that the duality of that whereby we're being requested to um, allow a structure to be built where a structure shouldn't be built to shelter a vehicle uh, excuse me shelter a trailer that's where a trailer oughtn't be but all this is happening simultaneously in the same location because there really is no other place on the lot where this can occur. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. So um, I have up on the other screen, the provision of the uh, bylaw. So it, again, it's in, it's in the uses section and it's in the accessory uses section, yep. which is a, uh, page 5-23. And I think part of the difficulty for me is that, first of all, it starts out by saying accessory storage of a recreational trailer or vehicle. And I'm, I'm willing to concede that it is something along those lines. So we're talking about use. And I think we all know that you can't give use variances. So if you said you know, I want to put a swimming pool there. Well, that's a different use, so you couldn't put it there. But then it it sort of goes it it sort of goes off uh, off track and says that you can have these particular accessory uses. But then it it provides a comment about the location where it says not in the front yard. And so to me, it's really referring to both the use and the location. And so the location strikes me in a way is not part of the use in and of itself. And it strikes me more as what we normally deal with when we're dealing with dimensional issues. So I'm just saying that because it does, I think, make this a bit more uh, convoluted for me. And I, I'm a little more ambivalent as a result. If that word not in the front yard, if that phrase not in the front yard was not there, I think it'd be a lot clearer. And, and I think that if you consider this as sort of now a location issue, as well as a use issue, I think it can go either way. And I'm just making that point because it, it may be sort of what decides it for me as I'm considering the rest of these criteria. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Can I just build on that a little bit? The, it, it's helpful, I think, or at least to me, it's helpful to look at the context here because this isn't like a separate provision of the bylaw that says uh, that storage of a recreational vehicle can never happen in a front yard. 
the purpose of the the place where that Mr. DuPont is quoting is defining the circumstances under which you can get a special permit. And after that, there are a bunch of yeses and then a couple of blanks, which mean no. And so what this is telling me is that you can do this by special permit as long as it's not in the front yard. But nobody is saying that there's this overriding policy that says that you couldn't do it by variance if the variance criteria already were met. Were, were met. This is a pretty limited sort of statement. And to turn sort of not into the front yard into something broader than just defining when a special permit is possible, um, I think gives it more importance than, than uh, it perhaps deserves. Right. Mr. Hamlin, just to clarify, so you, in your reading of that section, um, because I had gone back and forth on this, in my mind as well, you don't take that final phrase about not in the front yard as necessarily being a use restriction, but you see it more as, um, as you know, a dimensional or a, or another kind of uh, restriction that would be allowed would would that the board would be allowed to make a determination on. I th I think that I think that it, that that's correct. It, it, this just prevents us from doing this with a special permit, um, and which which nobody is asking us to do actually right so with that i think unless there's any further questions from the board i would like to move on to the direct discussion of the four criteria um and as mr hanlon had suggested i i think we it is good practice for us especially while we're online to vote um, on the four criteria specifically um, and so with that, the first criteria would be uh, to describe the circumstances relating to the soil condition, shape, topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. And the statement from the applicant was the primary outcrop and loam with irregular elevation variations up to across the property with pavers. Uh, Mr. Um, Chairman, your, your audio is in and out. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, it's in and I don't know if the other uh, board members have experienced the same thing, but your audio is in and out. Okay. Um, I think Mr. Mills was indicating he might have heard it fine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Valerelli. I, I appreciate that. You're good now, um, Chairman. Okay. So uh, with that, are, is there any questions from the board? Um, before I ask, and basically what this is not, you know, a vote on the final application. This is just a vote as to whether you find that, um, that this can, that the first condition is met. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I think it is. Uh, I think that the premise of this entire case really has been that the nature of that the basically the um, uh, the 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 topography of the lot really precludes if you if you're going to have a structure of this kind, or even the parking pad you now have, this is the only place you can put it, uh, and the staff supports that that view as well. So it seems to me that that uh, at least you get through this one. There, there may be other questions as to each of the other criteria, but whatever the problem is, it's a problem that's related to the topography of the lot. Yep. Mr. Dupont, do you concur? I do. Mr. Mills? Mr. Mills, do you concur? Yes, I agree. It's met. Mr. Riccadelli? I, I agree as well. I mean, the, the lot is large enough that um, were the topography not a problem, uh, there would be other spots to put this carport that would be within the zoning rights. So I agree. Thank you. And the chair agrees as well. 
Uh, this brings us to criteria number two, describe how a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw, specifically relating to circumstances affecting the land or structure noted above, would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the partitioner or appellant. Um, and the statement is that the proposed area for the carport is currently occupied by the travel trailer and a permanent solution for covered storage would limit weather damage or repairs to the antique trailer or vehicles in the area bounded by trees. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So I'm willing to start this off. I think that the, the uh, rationale that was advanced by the applicant was probably thought of before he's heard the discussion, which which would indicate that these are all individual personal things that are not the sort of thing that we can take into account. I mean, ultimately the issue here is whether or not uh, it's a hard, substantial hardship not to have a carport. Uh, just the way the question might be whether you don't can't have a garage or you can't have an addition to your house or whatever. Um, I've always been a little bit skeptical. This is not the sort of thing that deprives you of substantial use of your property. And I'm a little bit, I would like to hear what other people say uh, to be persuaded one way or the other on this. Um, but I do think that ultimately, as Mr. DuPont pointed out last time, the kind of hardship that's involved in many cases is precisely this sort of situation where the topography or the shape of the lot puts you in a position where without unreasonable expense, you can't do what is a perfectly reasonable, usual thing for people to do. Um, but obviously, uh, any, any addition would fall into that category as well. So lines have to be drawn. And it seems to me that this is a harder case than some uh, to qualify as a substantial hardship rather than an inconvenience. You know, I, I agree that this is a difficult, um, this is a dif difficult criteria to me. I could certainly understand, um, you know, if if the applicant was seeking to, you know, construct the, you know, has no parking, has no current garage space, is looking to build a garage, can't build it because of the the current topography of the site, um, and then came to the board seeking um, permission to build a garage, you know, just beyond the, the limits, excuse me, just beyond the limits of what can reasonably be constructed on a lot. That's certainly something um, that I think would be, you know, very worthy of uh, consideration. I'm a little more skeptical, um, a little bit just because of the, you know, the, the, the nature of the original intent was that, um, you know, the, the applicant has, you know, to his own admission, spent a great deal of time um, rehabilitating this trailer and is looking to protect it on his site. Um, and, you know, while that, while it's very understandable, the issue, bef you know, the part of the issue for me still is this question of, you know, there, there are other trailers and such stored around town. Um, and there are, you know, larger, larger recreational vehicles parked around town, but I haven't seen any of them under covered storage and uh, certainly not covered storage of this type. And so I'm not, I don't, I don't I'm not convinced that the necessarily that the applicant is being deprived of, of something that would otherwise be commonplace for, uh, for residents who have this type of a, a trailer. Um, you know, you routinely see boats that are stored out in the open. You routinely see recreational vehicles that are stored out in the open. Um, so the hardship of not being able to cover that that trailer, I'm not, well, I understand that, that it's a hardship because it creates a risk for the owner in regards to the protection of the trailer. Um, I'm not sure that that rises to the level of being a, a full hardship. Mr. Chairman, may I uh, interject on, on one point there? Please, Mr. Thomas. Yes, uh, relating this back to uh, the 
criteria that you showed in the beginning there of the blank criteria that had the example where the hardship wasn't necessarily related to you know potential damage to the structure or financial hardship on my on my side while that, mm -hmm. that is taken into account it also does relate almost like a topographic hardship as in the hardship relating to the topography which was the example given uh, under that mm -hmm. criteria so you know that was that was new information as as iterated there and, and and so i'd like to to make sure that that's that's brought up that the new criteria should be taken into account here on this decision thank you mr thomas Uh, other members of the board feel on this criteria. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So um, I think if, if we go back to the accessory storage provision in the use section, mm -hmm. and if we concede that someone could in fact store um, a trailer such as this on the property. Um, and then we sort of divorce that from the idea of the location. If, if we concede that the storage in and of itself of a trailer is permissible, but not in the front yard, I could be persuaded, I think, that really what we're talking about is the location of storage the carport part of it is a little bit of a problem for me, but if I confine this analysis to just what is the underlying issue, I, I look at it as storage perhaps, and then the location of the storage. And if you wanted to store the property, the trailer not in the front yard, you are hampered in doing that because of the topography. And I could more um, I could see that more in sort of the traditional analysis as if you wanted to put up a garage, but you couldn't do it. So to me, it's not so much the carport, the structure itself, as perhaps it is the use, which is the storage, and then coupled with that, the not in the front yard. So I might be thinking in terms of variance from the not in the front yard portion of it. And mm -hmm. the reason that I might consider that is because the topography prevents storage other than in the front yard. So mm -hmm. anyway. So if the applicant was able to have the trailer adjacent to the house outside of the front setback, then I think they would almost be able to build a carport. You know, I don't know specifically, but if it's possible, they could do the carport by right if it was outside of the setback. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I, I, I agree with that. I guess I, I'm, I'm stuck on, I'm, I'm trying to be really careful about using the expression carport because mm -hmm. it's defined to mean something that I think this isn't, but it is accessory st storage of a recreational trailer or a vehicle. And it does seem to me that the very fact that that is listed as something that one could routinely do if you didn't do it in the front yard uh, is kind of a counter to the observation that the chairman made that he hardly ever sees this happen. Uh, certainly the zoning bylaw contemplates that it may happen and is generally fairly favorable to it as long as it's not in a front yard. Understanding that, we do need to make a determination in regards to whether we can find um, that this criteria has been met. Uh, and in light of the, the conversation we've been having, I, I feel comfortable saying that the, you know, the literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw um, would require the, the owner to, you know, he would not be able to have this recre this recreational trailer on his property at all, and may either have to find offsite storage for it or might have to get rid of it. And just the, the vagaries of the topography leading to that 
um, and that would count for you know a second vehicle or you know any other storage use that um, that owing to the to the topography of the of the land that it is not possible to locate that trailer elsewhere. Uh, and I think I could find that the second criteria is met. I would agree. I think I would agree with that too. I also agree with that analysis. Thank you, Mr. Riccardelli. Too, I agree. Great, thank you. Mr. Hamlin, if you could scroll us down. <laughs> okay, hold on. Number three. Number three, describe how desirable leave may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. Um, so the applicant has, has stated the proposed area is bounded on two sides by a privacy fence and with a privacy gate to be installed, blocking the view of the area from all streets. The carport itself is aesthetically pleasing with a dark gray roof, more slightly, excuse me, slightly than the current blue tarp protecting the travel trailer. A rain catchment system will be installed which will reduce runoff down the alley from Spring Avenue. Um, can I comment in, in relation to um, to this criteria, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon, um, I'm actually reasonably persuaded by this, and I just would emphasize the view that staff takes that that Spring Avenue, while that may be a front yard according to the zoning bylaw, it functions enough as if it were really a side yard that it's it matters that if this really were a side yard, uh, it would not create the, any dimensional problems. Agreed. Mr. Chair, I, I agree what, as well. I think uh, because it's more of an access road than a, a front road, it makes this uh, issue less substantial. Thank you, Mr. Riccardelli. Mr. Mills? I agree with it. I think it, it meets the uh, criteria there. I agree as well. Um, I am just going to make a quick note that the applicant does mention here this question of the rain catchment system. Yes. Um, and because this will be actually because it's pavers to be impervious because it has a shelter on it, that they may very well trigger um, the need for additional review by uh, the engineering department. So I'm just going to make a note of that. Okay. Um, and that brings us to criteria number four, which is describe how desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaws. Um, and the applicant had written that a variance allowing a setback of six feet from an underdeveloped portion of Spring Avenue is requested. The presence of a, the steep hill, trees and rock wall prohibit the placement of the carport at the proper setback. The house is not conforming, currently set back 15 feet from Spring Avenue. So there's minimal visual impact from Spring Avenue. The area is already developed and bounded by privacy fences. So minimum impact due to a variance is proposed. Their commentary on this criteria. Nullification or substantial derogation from the intent or purpose. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So uh, I'm not very dogmatic about this. Uh, so I could easily change my mind in light of what my colleagues say. Um, but it seems to me that, that there is a policy which appears in various parts of the zoning ordinance that attempt to limit what it is you can do in a front yard. Um, and we've been wrestling actually with one of those here, but there's lots of stuff that, is, that ultimately aims to keep parking and other kinds of uses out of the front yard. 
Um, and so the question to my mind is whether that general policy in the zoning ordinance applies here with sufficient force to enable us to say that it substantially derogates from the purpose of the zoning ordinance. Now, in some ways, every variance we grant derogates from the attended purpose of the zoning bylaw just because there's a rule that we're varying and that has some effect. So the issue here seems to me to be substantially uh, and for reasons that also came up in the other, it seems to me that given the nature of Spring Avenue and given the fact that the, that if this were a side yard at Spring Avenue and, and this weren't a corner lot, if it was next door, um, we would not have this problem, suggest to me that it's not a substantial derogation for the intended purpose of the bylaw. I agree as well. Me as well. I agree also, Chairman. Well, um, I was just in the background reviewing the um, the section of the zoning bylaws titled purpose, um, which is rather long, so I won't uh, read it into the record here, but essentially um, it speaks about promotions of health, health safety, convenience, uh, welfare, health, and sort of open space and land, most appropriate use of land throughout the town, environmental quality, et cetera. Um, and I think in light of that, I could, that this would not um, nullify or substantially derogate from that. So with that, the board has, um, found that the four criteria for a variance are met. Um, so should the, the next step for the board um, would be if there are any conditions to be uh, applied to this application. Um, so the board typically has three standard uh, conditions, which I will read into the record. Uh, condition number one, the plans and specifications. Of, oh, we should. Before I get into the, well, no, I'll read it. Plan specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There shall be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Number two, the building inspector is hereby notified that he's to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time there's a determination that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And standard number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Um, I paused on the first one because I recall that the applicant had, um, in the information they had provided to the board, um, they had actually given a couple different options for what the carport may be like. Um, and I didn't want to go back to that. So Mr. Hanlon, if I could have you uh, stop sharing. I'd be happy to. Yes. Um, so this was, there are several different versions. This is the carport that's open on all four sides and is just the two roof surfaces. Um, so there's a couple different views. These are not specific to the site, these views. These are provided by the manufacturer. Uh, this is a pre-manufactured structure. Um, these are different, three different views. And as this one notes, this would be the actual color of the roof. And as an option, it also provided um, one with some more enclosure to it for 
um, you know, complete enclosure. And I, from the commentary provided by the applicant, that's the intent is the one that has less is is this is the intent that's open that's fully open and not having panels on the side. Um, so that is the is the board comfortable with that with with the option that you're seeing now being the what we're asking the applicant to proceed with. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, I'd be comfortable with that if the applicant went on record as saying that's his proposal and that's what he would consider to be the subfinal plan that would be submitted to the building inspector. Mr. Thomas. Yes, that is the proposal that I uh, that I would like to go with. Thank you. Your one there with no sides, no enclosure. So we will make that as condition number four. That's a car port without side or end panels. Um, and then I would also add the um, that the board requests the applicant work with the town engineer to address compliance with the town's by law. And depending on the area covered, that may or may not apply, but it just would include that as a provision. Conditions the board would want to apply. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanley. Um, we haven't really focused much on this, but how important is it to us that this isn't a real carport? It's a storage mechanism for a recreational trailer. Um, I mean, eventually when the, when the trailer isn't used anymore or whatever, or when there's a new, this structure is going to remain, it could have a car in it, just like the one that we see now. Um, I don't know whether I care about that. We haven't really discussed it. Uh, but if we use the word carport, then it will necessarily imply that you could put a motor vehicle inside it. And I just want to raise whether any of us have an objection to that. From my, I mean, from my perspective, if we are approving this for the storage of a trailer, we are also you know, for whatever storage purpose um, that's allowable under the bylaws that any future inhabitant would want to store in this place. Right, and, and the section that we've been referring to does also refer to motor vehicles. Yes. You know, if there was a boat that could go under there, that's fine. If somebody wanted to store, um, you know, construction equipment related to a business, that may be a very that different, would, that would be different thing depending on how the, how the bylaw is written. Um, would like to amend the, so I had the condition I had proposed, um, that the carpenters be provided with outside or end panels, I would want to add to that, uh, that the structure is not to be enclosed in the future. So this cannot be then closed off and made into a shed or a different structure in the future. Right, Mr. Chairman. Just to the, the idea yes, of a carport, yeah. if we think that what this is, is is close enough to a carport that, you know, if it walks like a duck, it's a duck. But um, there, that the bylaw definition says that it has to be open on at least two sides. Uh, mm -hmm. And what's being proposed is being open on all four sides. And that makes it sort of a different kind of structure than even if you put, I mean, put two sides in. So. It seems to me that what the applicant is committing to is this plan and this plan is completely open and should not be enclosable in beyond this at all without coming back and uh, seeking a modification of the variance. So the structure is not to be enclosed in the future without action, without action from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Right. Okay. Are there any other conditions from members of the board? Uh, seeing none, uh, what we have before us, it's a request for variance. 
um, at 24th Grandview Road, and there are our three standard um, conditions and the two additional, the one related to the carport uh, remaining open, and the second in regards to uh, working with the town engineer in regards to stormwater management. And with that, um, I would be looking for a motion from the board. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the application be uh, approved subject to the conditions that the chair has just read into the record. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Okay. With that, then a roll call. The vote before the board is um, a motion to approve the variance application for 24 Grandview Road with the five conditions. Um, as stated previously, uh, motion by Mr. Hanlon, seconded by Mr. DuPont, the roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The variance application for 24 Grandview Road is approved. <clears throat> thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. <clears throat> well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to provide a good uh, mental exercise on a. <laughs> Car park, carport variance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, going back to brings us back to our agenda. Um, the next item on our agenda is item number five, docket 3708, 12, excuse me, 12 Prospect Avenue. Um, I could ask the applicant to um, reintroduce themselves and let us know if there have been any um, any changes on their side. Hi, I'm Althea Iokamidis. I'm the homeowner here. I'm Dean Iokamidis. Um, I'm the builder. Great, thank you. Welcome, welcome to you both back. Um, wanted to open up the application package real quick. Okay. So we had discussed last time, this is a request as if this is also a variance request. Um, and it is specifically for uh, an addition, which would be into the left side setback. There's the side plan. Um, so the side, the required side yard setback is 10 feet. Um, the proposed addition, because the house is not perpendicular, is not parallel to the side yard, um, the addition is only 8 point, is proposed to only be 8.1 feet from the setback on the side yard. Um, even though it's compliant at the front edge. And uh, I had spoke, we had spoken last time, um, uh, particular to the applicant, um, they do have a child with needs and they would like to do this to uh, allow them to create a better living condition for her, um, specifically in this, uh, in this location on the lot. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, there was a couple of questions that come out of the discussion last time. One was whether there were any specific provisions in law that would um, that would be particular to a situation like this, where the proposal is on behalf of somebody um, who has needs, and that this would be a, a, an assistance to them. Um, the provisions of federal and state law both seem to apply only to um, to larger structures, structures that are basically under the um, the commercial code. So buildings that are you know, five or more units for residential or commercial. And so don't specifically relate to this situation. Um, but I believe there is a provision that uh, if there was, if somebody was to propose an accessible ramp, that that could not be opposed directly, but that the, um, but the, the addition of structure would not fall under that, uh, that protection. And um, so we had looked into that specifically. And then um, in my conversations, I had spoken with um, 
talked with town council about this again um, and his <clears throat> his statement as we had stated in the prior hearing is that when the board is looking at these decision at this variance decisions the variance is something that goes with the land it doesn't go with the owner and that the board in its determinations and its findings needs to find that there is that per the criteria that there is something in particular about the land and the structure and the way that they're the way that the that impacts the ability to utilize the site and we need to use that in the determination of variance and that we're not supposed to be looking at the individual needs of the current homeowner um, and that there is considerable uh, precedent in state law that 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 we are we are not to be making a specific determination for an individual homeowner um, that we're to look at the the land and and property as a whole. Uh, so I just want to remind the the board of that, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. I just I just wanted to add that I, I did look up Mr. Bobrowski, who's the the primary the major authority on uh, on uh, land use and zoning in Massachusetts, and he put it this way that it's well settled that personal hardship, however heartrending is not a proper factor for consideration. And the cases that he gives involve things like the personal health of the owner of the property, the uh, facilitating the care of an aging, of an aging parent, uh, requirements by the increased nursing home requirements, reg regulations that require expansions and so forth. And all of that is in the area that for better or for worse, and I think in many cases for worse, uh, we're not allowed to take take into consideration. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so I think that to the question then before the board, um, I can back up to the application. Um, <clears throat> so the in discussing the criteria, so the, the first criteria is that are there circumstances related to the soil condition, slope, topography, especially affecting land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. And you know, this is a large lot. And as the applicant says, the topography is it, it's flat, it's rocky, sandy soil, it's ideal soil for building and the site is flat. There's lots of places um, on the site where construction could take place. And you know, understanding that the driveway is in this location here on the plant, but not shown on the plant, but the, the driveway is on this side, um, that there is room on this side for 28 by 12 um, addition. There's space towards the rear of the lot and there's space to the front of the lot where um, the addition could take place. And in my viewing of this, there, unfortunately, there really isn't any condition relative to soil condition or topography that would preclude building in another portion of the site. I understand very clearly from the presentation last time that you know, this really is the ideal location on the site as far as the homeowners and the way that they occupy their house and the way that they want to occupy their house. Um, but I, I would have a very difficult time finding, for, finding the first criteria met. And I would want to hear from the other members of the board their feelings on that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I agree with that. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> as the application does say flat, yep. um, the topography does go down. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the surveyor did not get enough time to come out and do a topo of the land. It does slope down about five feet front to back, which would uh, cause a uh, significant larger uh, accessible ramp to mm -hmm. get to the property. So that is one of the criteria of putting it. Although the soil conditions doesn't prevent us from going in the back, the topography does um, because of the elevation. Mm -hmm. it, it does make it more difficult, but it does not 
it wouldn't preclude the construction. That's correct. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I, I too share the same, uh, same feelings uh, that you had just expressed in terms of understanding the desirability of placing it where it's been proposed, but also not seeing anything that is related to the shape topography or soil condition that would preclude uh, doing the work in another area. So I, I would not see that criteria one has been met. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Um, Mr. Mills? I agree, Mr. DuPont. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Riccardelli? I, I tend to agree with you all as well. Thank you. Um, so with that, so the the way the conditions work is that the, the board needs to agree that all four criteria are met. And in this regard, the board has agreed that the, the first condition um, of the granting of a variance is not met. Um, and as such, the board cannot um, grant the variance in this request. Um, so with that, um, I would ask that the, the board doesn't really need to go through the remainder of the, um, the conditions and, unless Mr. Hanlon, you think that it's worthwhile for the board to do so. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, th I think it's up to the board. It is an adequate gr ground to deny the application uh, if we decide that there's any one of these four uh, that can't be met. Um, it isn't our usual practice to get to one that fails and then stop, uh, but, I, but it's a certainly a defensible, defensible thing to do and uh, may, it, in some ways I'm attracted, Mr. Chairman, to doing that because it keeps us from having to say and to get involved in what might be tricky questions about the next three criteria that we would then have to live with when new cases come down and just sort of parsimony about not deciding any more than we have to uh, would justify not going any further than we have. Well, the second criteria builds directly on the first. Um, so is there Describe how literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaws specifically related to the circumstances affecting the land or structure would involve substantial hardship. Um, and so without having found that the first is met, I'm not sure how one would respond to the second. So Mr. Chairman, if we go back to the drawing board and bring our setbacks to 10 foot, yep. uh, then we would be within our right to build, correct? Um, as long as it's under 750 square feet. If it's more than 750 square feet, then you'd be you would need a special permit, but right. you would not need a variance. Which it is under 750 square feet. So, um, so at this point, since you know you guys can't uh, go past criteria one, um, either yourselves or us would withdraw from this. Um, and then go back to the drawing board, uh, redraw it. We can step the addition and um, we can just go by right um, and build it. Okay. Um, so, your, so at this point, um, the applicant has offered to withdraw. Um, is the board, it would require a vote of the board, but I, I think given the circumstances, it's a very reasonable request from the applicant. Um, are there any questions from members of the board? No. No. Nope. Okay. Um, so with your uh, with permission of the applicant, I would uh, entertain a, a motion of the board to ex uh, accept the withdrawal of the application for variance for 12 Prospect Avenue. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, just confirmation with the, with the applicant that that's okay? Yeah. Yes, it's fine. 
Perfect. Thank you. Uh, then a vote of the board to accept the withdrawal of 12 Prospect Avenue. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, and the variance application for 12 Prospect is withdrawn. Thank you very much to the applicants. Thank you for your time. Very welcome. This brings us to next item on our agenda, number six, uh, docket 3709, 49 Valentine Road. Uh, this is a request for a special permit. And um, I would ask the applicant to uh, please introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. And I will pull up their application package. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are Elizabeth and Brian Crowley, the homeowners of 49 Valentine, um, seeking to add an addition to our house. And we also have Eve Eisenberg, who is our architect and the author of the application. Good evening. Good evening. Um, turn on sharing. This is the application. to hear and um, tell us what you would like to do. Um, we are we are looking to put an addition on the back of the house to contain a master bedroom suite and an expansion of the kitchen. And um, we are hoping that you will agree with the senior planner that the um, the architectural design criteria for the town are met. Um, my name is Eve Eisenberg. I'm with Inkstone Architects in Concord, Massachusetts, by the way. And uh, I just am happy to entertain any questions that uh, anyone on the board has. So just I would re remind the board and let the public know this is so this is the request is specifically um, it's under the provisions for a large addition. Um, there are no other um, issues involved with the with the property. Currently, the property is non-conforming in regards to the left side setback, but that is not being that setback is not being changed. Um, the extension towards the rear does not um, affect the rear yard setback, nor does it affect the amount of usable open space on the property. Um, and my, I believe I just want to confirm that the, pro that the house is being, will be a two-story building. It's not going to two and a half. Is that correct? That's correct. So this is the site plan. Um, this is the house currently as it sits here, as you can see in the image. And then the proposed addition is this portion here. So again, much clearer. Um, so this is the existing house. This is the proposal. So it's both the structure off the back and then the, the dormers into the front. Um, this is the existing views, and this is a rendering of the <coughs> proposed views after. And this is the set of existing plans, existing elevations, the proposed basement and first floor, in addition here off the back. And the second story, the addition off the back, plus the dormers at the front, and then the roof plan. And again, the, the revised elevations. A couple of sections. back to the application. Uh, so where, the, where this is a special permit request and specifically uh, where it's under the provision for a large addition, um, the board needs to make a determination that the change is not substantially more uh, detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and the board typically does that through the application of the special permit. 
uh, in the special permit criteria. Um, so the criteria here are not super filled out, um, but I can sort of guess why. Um, so indicate whether the requested use is listed in the table of use regulations as allowed by special permit. Um, so that would be the provision for large addition. Um, explain why the requested use is essential or desirable. Um, for the public, actually, I will switch over because this is not, I'll switch to the, uh, to the re review memo by the um, planning department. That's a little more complete. Um, so the requested use, the requested use is permitted through a special permit in the R1 zoning district. Criteria two regarding public convenience and welfare, the proposal would provide additional living space and the board can find that this condition is met. Um, criteria number three, um, that the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion nor unduly impair pedestrian safety. Uh, this is all at the rear of the property. It will not increase traffic uh, because it does not change the, uh, the occupancy of the home. Um, criteria number four, the requested use will not overload any public water drainage or sewer system or any other municipal systems to such an extent that the requested use or any developed use in the immediate area or in any other area of town will be unduly subjected to the hazards affecting the health, safety, or the general welfare. Um, and this would not be an undue burden to municipal systems for this similar reason to criteria three that is not dramatically increasing the use of the property. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Criteria number four. Sorry. Yes, Mr. Hanley. No, I, you, you should go through these. I, I, what I have is not going to relate to this. Okay. Um, number five is describe how any special regulations for the use as may be provided in the zoning bylaw including but not limited to the provisions uh, there's an error fulfilled so that the proposal would not result in any need for special regulation the board typically finds that um they to the to the, it's the regulation that involves the special permit for a large addition Criterion six, explain why the requested use will not impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts nor be detrimental to health, safety, and welfare. Um, criteria is the homes in the vicinity include a range of architectural styles, capes, colonial revivals, and bungalows. Gable dormers are a common feature in the surrounding neighborhood while other dormer types are less prevalent on Valentine Road and adjacent streets. And consistent with the residential design guidelines, the proposed design will add visual interest to the front the combined shed dormer flanked by gable dormers is well proportioned for the facade does not interrupt the existing streetscape pattern. <coughs> Rear addition is designed to complement the scale and style of the structure in the neighborhood. Um, so the applicant is encouraged to explore potential for minor adjustments to the location of the proposed doors and windows to better align these elements on adjacent floors and establish a pattern for spacing. Overall proposal would not detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the districts or the adjoining districts, nor will it be detrimental to the health, morals, or welfare of the neighbors of the property. And criteria number seven, uh, explain why the requested use will not by its addition to a neighborhood cause an excess of the use that would be detrimental to the character of the neighborhood. Um, and this would not be any detrimental excess to a, increasing the size of a residential structure within a residential neighborhood. And then the, the planning department had included, this is just an aerial photograph of the house itself. Um, and this is the, the view from the front. Okay, Mr. That, Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I just, in going back to the law that applies to this, um, I, I wanted to, there, there actually sort of is a special regu regulation with respect to large, uh, <coughs> excuse me, with respect to large additions. Uh, the zoning bylaw prohibits them uh, unless the Board of Appeals acting pursuant to section 3.3, which is what the chair just read, found that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. So the underlying criteria here is being in harmony with other structures and uses in the facility, in the vicinity. In making its determination, the Board of Appeals shall consider among other relevant facts, 
the proposed alteration or additions, dimensions, and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses and its conformity to the purposes of the zoning bylaw. Um, so the point that I think comes from that, much of what is in that second to last uh, paragraph of the opinion of the uh, planning uh, board is, is or the, the planning department, really kind of relates to this, but it's just kind of a more specific thing that focuses on, um, that focuses a little more on abutting properties than than other provisions of the of the bylaw do. Uh, in any event, that's that's the standard that ultimately we're going to have to find. Um, are there Questions or comments from the board for the applicant? I think that's it. Switch my share screen back to the application itself. Now I can't cut it and look around because I can't change it. Well, I'm, I'm pointing this. Um, so there's a question raised by the um, Planning department about the the spacing and arrangement of the windows. Um, my sense is it's probably in relation to this elevation here. Um, so back up a little bit. So it's no, it's, the, it's at the first floor level, and so the placement of those windows is driven by the location of the stove and the refrigerator. Um, um, I'm assuming that if you were to try to align these, take these vertical lines through the windows that that would cause issues for the kitchen itself. The kitchen, uh, the development of the kitchen plan was the, the the motivator for the fenestration on the on the west elevation, but it's really the the north elevation in the bottom lower hand corner there, uh, where you see the the appearance of a well. There's a shed dormer on either side, and the existing roof down below, um, yep. giving that proportion and the scale to the addition, which is um, making it seem like it's the same size as the original house. That causes the top windows to be moved back if that makes sense so yep. that's what it's the second floor windows that are out of line um but i don't i don't want to lose the effect of having a, a dormer there mm -hmm. instead of just building a one large mass and yep. lining up the windows okay thank you for that sure thank you other questions for, questions from the board mr chairman yes mr riccadelli I just wanted to confirm um, with the applicant that, uh, you know, from the spreadsheet, it says that uh, the height is the same, but is, is the ridge line of the existing roof uh, consistent? You guys are just uh, matching it with the, the addition. We're, we're matching it with the addition. Okay, excellent, thank you. What's there any? For the questions from the board, um, I would like to open for public comment. So, as a reminder, um, um, so members, public. Uh, questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be addressed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Those wishing to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. And those calling in by telephone can dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. Uh, you'll be called upon in order by the host and asked to give your name and address to the record and then given time for your questions and comments. Um, so with that, uh, the first hand is Mr. Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I was looking at the, uh, the application and I saw the site plan 
might have been the old site plan. Is there a tree in the front yard? The pictures didn't seem to show it, so I'm guessing the answer is no. I will let the homeowners respond to that. Did you say a tree in the front yard? Is that what you were asking? Yeah, the old site plan showed one to the right of the property. There's a tree and there's a, a small dogwood tree in our front yard. There was a tree, another one from a long time ago that the town had to take down because it died. Um, but other than that, there's just the one tree in the front yard. Okay, I think I think that probably is what happened. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, there are a number of very large trees on this property, mostly at the edges of setbacks. And it looks like the, um, the construction as proposed is not going to impact these trees, which uh, is laudable always, as you know, from, from my point of view, these large trees are part of the mature tree canopy. I'm wondering what the current plan is that the owners have to protect these trees during construction. Um, have the owners considered any provisions for tree protection during the construction process? So there are two large trees that along the back of the property that um, we had an arborist come and take a look and he didn't have any issue with those. They're healthy, strong trees. Um, there was one other tree that was starting to rot with one large limb that was coming out already over the existing house really um, that they did recommend taking down regardless of um, any addition. So we did we did complete that and okay. they found quite a bit of rot in it. So, but the two large trees in the back and the, uh, yeah, he said that it shouldn't be a problem with the, uh, with the construction. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. So one tree was taken that was rotted and the other tree is going to be protected during construction. I know that these lots in Arlington are small and um, this construction is significant and uh, I think it's going to be kind of tricky to protect the tree. I would suggest you engage the tree warden to um, figure out the best way to do that, since I believe that's probably a requirement now that um, now that you're proceeding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, yeah, and and to Mr. Mr. Moore's point, um, as you go through the application process, one of the one of the steps you'll have to do is a it's a compliance check with the town's tree bylaw, and that will involved the that will be an involvement with the tree warden um, but that will come as a part of the of the plan review should the process move forward um the next person on the list um part of my vision um is marianne uh Kicklist. oh sorry you're on mute ma'am okay now you now can you hear me? I can. I just need your name. Yeah, my name's Marianne Kipples. Name and address for the record. Yeah, I live on 33 Valentine Road, which is just a couple of houses up, and I'm here in support of Brian and Liz for their addition at the house. There's going to be just a little bit of an effect from the vision from the street wise. They're still going to have their lawn. It's still going to look residential. It's not like it's going to come right up to that lot lines, from what I can see, and I would like to see them be able to continue to live in the neighborhood. It's, an, it's, a, it's a great neighborhood and they're a wonderful addition to it. And I would like to see that addition go through. And my neighbor, my next door neighbor at number 29, Claudine, she also supports the addition. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next on our list, um, is Erin Shanley? Yes, hi, this is Erin Shanley and Nula McGowan. We're also neighbors of Liz and Brian and we are here in support also. We, um, we fully support their opportunity to expand their home and um, are willing to answer any questions you have regarding the neighborhood, but we're here to in show of support. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions from the further questions from the public? No further questions from the public. I'm going to go ahead and close the, the public comment period. Um, 
so what the board has before it is a special permit request uh, for a large addition uh, for a, a, a small home on Valentine Road. Um, the proposed addition as was stated by the planning board um, is very well in keeping with the residential design guidelines. Um, it's nice that it's a very it's a very modest proposal in terms of um, some of the some of the some of the additions the board sees. Um, it looks like it'll be a very nice addition um, on the streetscape and the larger portion of it is to the of the property, which um, is currently free and clear. So it doesn't cause any uh, tree canopy issues and there's still a very large portion of yard that's preserved um, for the for the use of the, the residents. So I, I think those are all very positive things. Um, are there any further questions or comments from the from the board? Seeing none, um, should the should the board vote in the affirmative? Um, the board would institute the three standard conditions that were read earlier this evening into the record. Um, are there any further conditions that board members feel would be appropriate um, to attach to this special permit request? No. I see none. Um, so with that and no further questions from the board, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the application be approved subject to the standard conditions which have been previously read into the record. Second. Mr. Hanlon, second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So the vote before the board is to approve the special permit application for 49 Valentine Road with the three standard conditions as put forward by Mr. Hanlon and seconded by Mr. DuPont. Are there any questions about what the board is voting on? Being none, I will take a roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The special permit for 49 Valentine Road is approved. Thank you very Thank much. You much. Wonderful news. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> very much. Okay, with that, those two files here. And, uh, the next item on our agenda is docket is number seven, which is docket 37103 Varnum Road. I'll ask the applicant to go ahead and introduce themselves and tell us what they'd like to do. And I will go about opening up the application package. Thank you. My name is Jen Cartagino. I am the homeowner and the architect. Um, I would like to put a new bedroom and bathroom in a currently unfinished attic of a two and a half story uh, two family dwelling and adding some dormers in order to do so. Uh, the lot is currently non conforming in overall size and usable open space, but the proposed plan does not increase the non conformity um, because it is just um, finishing the attic space. So there are some dormers involved in that, however. Um, I will say uh, that it, the design is consistent with the residential design guidelines published in Arlington and consistent with other homes in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, so I hope you all agree and happy to entertain any questions. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so this is the the site plan, and as the applicant has stated, um, the currently there is no the, there is no portion of the yard that meets the requirements of usable open space. Correct. Um, the, the backyard is uh, only twenty three feet deep. And as we know, under under this town bylaw, it has to be at least 25 by 25 in order to qualify as usable open space. So this is a, an application that the board, uh, the type of application the board often sees where um, an applicant has no usable open space, which is tied to um, the gross floor area of the building. And as the gross floor area of the building is being increased by the, the attic level addition, 
technically they were required to have more usable open space, but as they already have none, um, this is essentially uh, that there's a nonconformity and this is an, an intensification of an existing nonconformity, which is something um, that under state law, the board uh, needs to make a determination uh, in regards to uh, that intensification as a part of their uh, determination. So uh, that's the reasoning behind this coming before the board. Just briefly, again, as, as was stated, it's 23 feet is the short dimension in the rear yard. And there's no other portion of the yard that is greater than that. So there's no space. Construction documents, so the demolition plans, um, including the openings in the roof, the proposed additions, um, the proposed plan up in the upper level. This is, these portions will be under the shed dormers, and then the stair going up will be under um, the split cable here at the rear. Ceiling plans, and then these are the elevations. So from the rear, um, you have this sort of half cable, split cable here, and then um, you have the uh, the two shed dormers, uh, one to either side. Be contained to the distance um, along the ridge. It does not change the shape of the hip of the roof. Interior sections, elevations, uh, structural drawings. We'll quickly just switch over to this is the memorandum from the planning department. Um, refers back to the special permit criteria. Um, Requested use. Uh, the current use is it's a two family and in our two districts, so there's no issues in regards to the requested use. Um, public convenience the two family use will not change. It simply provides additional living space for the upper unit. Uh, traffic congestion and impairment of public safety will not change because there's there's no change to the to the number of folk, people living in the property, and there's no change to. Uh, anything on this involving the, the street levels uh, of the property. Um, there's no undue burden on the municipal systems as it's not changing the population density. Um, the special regulation, um, in this case, I believe it would be that the application of the, uh, I remember the number off the top of my head, um, but it's the, provision under section eight of our bylaws that allows us to um, allow for the intensification of an existing nonconformity. Um, criteria number six notes that the vicinity is primarily two family structures, several nonconforming three family structures, the large dormers are a prevalent feature throughout the neighborhood. And then consistent with the residential design guidelines, the addition will complement the style of the existing structure in the adjacent homes in the neighborhood. Overall, the proposal would not detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district, nor the adjoining districts, nor will it be detrimental um, to the neighborhood property. However, the applicant is encouraged to explore the potential to adjust the location of the dormer window on the east elevation to better align with the window pattern on lower levels. Applicant, no, excuse me, applicant may also wish to explore other alternatives the rear dormer to make it a less dominant feature of the roof. Um, there would not be any detrimental excess of any particular use. Um, but briefly, this is the image uh, of the house from above, and then the view from the front. Um, maintain the proposal is consistent with the special permit criteria. That in mind, I'm going to stop sharing this. Are there questions or comments from the board? Not seeing any? Mm 
we'll then briefly just go back to the application package. Just to review the comment from the planning board, they were asking on the east elevation, so I believe it is the, this window here. They were asking about uh, step out in the wrong direction. There is the not far enough. Uh, so, believe, so related to the to the bathroom, um, and I'm assuming that the location of the fixtures in the bathroom are related to the trying to maintain a, a wet wall going down through the building. Is that correct? It is. It is trying to maintain the wet wall to align with the window below would mean uh, placing that new window kind of within that wet wall, which which just isn't um, functionally feasible. Understand the comment. Ideally, mm -hmm. that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Also, it is up at the third floor level, and it's in the dormer, and the the roof is continuous below, so it does sort of minimize the visual impact from below. Mm -hmm. That was the hope. Yeah. And then I think the other question they had was whether this needed to be as prominent as it is, um, but I'm assuming that the size of it is driven by the head height requirements for the stairs. It is, it is. Um, fortunately, just with the hip roof, it was tough to find a good spot for the head clearance for the stairs. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, I will go ahead and open this hearing for public comment. As stated before, public comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Um, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. And those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. Are there any members of the public who wish to address this application before the board? Any members of the public wishing to address this application before the board? Mr. Moore. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, through you, is this a condominium and another owner lives on the first floor? Um, I would prefer that to the applicant. Uh, it is a condominium. Um, and my first floor uh, neighbors have approved the plan. They just were out of town um, this week, so unable to make it on. Um, they are in full approval of the plan. Uh, great, Mr. Chair. That's ex that was exactly uh, my interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, so the matter before the board, this is a, a special permit request. Um, in particular, it's a, you know, a section six determination of an intensification of the existing nonconformity in regards to the usable open space. Um, the proposal is an addition in the, uh, at the attic floor level uh, of an existing two-story building with a hipped roof. And there will be a shed dormer to both sides and uh, sort of a half gable uh, to the rear to accommodate the stair. Um, should the board uh, vote to approve this application, um, I would recommend that the board adopt the standard three conditions. Are there, that were previously read into the record, are there any other conditions the board would want to um, include for this application? Seeing none, are there any further questions from the board? M Mr. Chairman, may I ask Mr. one Cardelli, question? Please. Uh, this is for the applicant. Um, could you just explain what the um, the finishes of the new the new dormers are? They are they um, siding to match the the rest of the house? They are siding to match the rest of the house. Unfortunately, okay. we are vinyl sided, so I'm continuing that. Above. Understood. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli. Um So with that, um, the board is ready. For a vote, if I could ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. 
Uh, I move that the application be approved subject to the three standard conditions. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont and Mr. Hanlon. So the vote before the board is a motion to approve the special permit application for 33 Barnum with three conditions as put forward by Mr. Hanlon and seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, are there any questions with what the vote entails? Seeing none, I would do a roll call vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Uh, and uh, the chair votes aye. So that is a, a positive uh, five person vote for to approve the special permit for 33 Varnum Road with the three standard conditions. Thank you very much. With that, go back to our, close a few files here and go back to our agenda. Next on our agenda is docket number, uh, item number eight, docket number 3711, 101 Robbins Road. Uh, so I would ask the applicant to introduce yourself and I will open up the, uh, the application. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lauren Duddy on 101 Robbins Road. My husband and I are looking to have a covered front porch as part of a recent home addition. Um, and I have my architect, John Piazzatelli, on the call as well, who will be able to answer any questions and explain the project a little bit further. Good Thank, evening, you much. Board. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, as Lauren indicated, um, we are proposing to add a front porch to the home. Um, the, as, we, as the, the porch is not allowed as of right due to its uh, projection into the front setback, um, which would reduce uh, an existing 26 foot setback to approximately 21 feet. Um, and the covered porch would project the, um, would, would uh, span the entire front of the home. The um, side yard is an existing non-conforming use. And the, um, the, uh, the intention of the porch was to help uh, sort of divide and reimagine the front of the home so that it's rather than a, a vertical facade, it provides a little bit of uh, relief to that, to that facade and helps articulate the um, front of the home a little bit more than just a standard straight facade. Um, generally in the design, we tried, I tried to incorporate and maintain uh, ideas that were consistent with the neighborhood environment as well as the design guidelines uh, outlined by the, by the town. If there are any questions, we're more than happy to, um, to address those. Thank you very much. Um, this is the site plan. Uh, is the details plan specifically of the front porch. Um, if I re remember correctly, currently um, the area of the, there's a, a sort of stoop in this area, but I don't, is it covered currently? Uh, it has a small roof over the, over the front. There's, a, there's an existing picture, I believe, in the end of the package that was. Submitted. Oh, okay, perfect. These are side elevations. Of the porch. No, the package doesn't have it. Oh, but the. I mean, it's, sorry, it's, yeah, it's the it's the. Uh, the package in the planning board that has it. Yes, yeah, the planning board. That's correct. Sorry. Okay, so this is the planning board. Um, nope, I propose porch. Uh, so yeah. Ooh. So this is the this is the existing home. That's correct. And as we had, as was discussed, the application the proposal is for a porch that would extend the full width of the front um, and be covered the full length, but be uh, be open. Are there questions, um, comments from the board? Um, I'm just going to quickly go back and 
review the criteria as put forward by the planning department. Um, the requested use is permitted. It's, an R, it's a single family residence in an R1 zoning district. Uh, so that it can be approved by the granting of a special permit. Um, the request here specifically um, is for a porch. Um, there is a lot, there is a, a, a substantial um, addition that is going on to the house, but it is within most, it is in, almost entirely within the footprint of the house and as such is not, um, does not need a determination for a large addition. Um, so that is not before us. What's before us is only the question of the front porch. Um, yeah. Criteria number two about public convenience and welfare. The proposal would improve the convenience and safety of the owner's entrance to their home. And it also, um, as we've seen many front porch um, addition requests, um, especially since the, the, the onset of COVID where people are looking for a place where they can uh, meet outside. Um, so that would facilitate that as well. Um, criteria number three about undue traffic congestion impairment of public safety. Um, the porch is not very close at all to the street, so it will not impair sight lines. Um, and as it will not change the uh, amount of traffic uh, on the property. It will not change the bird the municipal systems. Um, and the do not result in a need for any particular special regulation beyond uh, the special permit approval uh, as required in the section related to porches. Criteria number six regarding the integrity and character of the district proposed front porch exceeds maximum square footage allowable by right, covered or enclosed, or, but there are common feature structures in the surrounding neighborhood, including Robbins Road, in the immediate vicinity, the home across the street has a covered porch, which expands the full width. Consistent with the residential design guidelines, the proposed design will introduce human scale architecture. Furthermore, the proposal replaces a portico with a usable front porch that will reduce the appearance of height of the renovated structure. Overall, this proposal would not detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district or adjoining district, or be detrimental. Um, and would not cause a detrimental effect. And as we had shown before, this is the image of the house from above. And this is the existing house itself. So are there any further questions from the board? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and open this hearing for public comment. Um, as stated before, public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and is to help the, inform the board in regards to their decision. Um, members of the public who wish to speak should uh, raise their hand using the participant tab on the Zoom application or a dial star nine to indicate who would like to speak. Um, with that, uh, we have our first public comment is from Mr. Loretti. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me okay? We can, it's a little choppy, but it's sort of been that way all night. Yeah, you have been too. Um, you know, interrupt me if you can't. Um, uh, just a Absolutely. few comments. Um, first, you know, I, I kind of take exception to the planning department recommending what your board should do. Um, certainly they can advise you on what's been done in the past and what the zoning implications are, but it's really not their charge to make policy determinations on these types of um, applications. And frankly, I think they were pretty superficial in the way they looked at this one. Um, first, it's not exactly clear what section of the bylaw allows you to grant a special permit for a projection more than three and a half feet into the front yard setback. Clearly, this is more than um, 25 square feet, but it's not clear to me that with just a special permit, um, you can go more than that uh, three and a half feet into that setback. Um, and that's under 5.3.9. A, I don't think 5.3.9B applies because that's for a, a, an open deck or unenclosed steps, which this really isn't. Um, but my bigger concern, and I think um, I haven't seen anyone raise this issue, is that once you put that porch there, you're reducing the usable open space on this lot. And the applicant has produced a substantial addition to the house. Even if that's within the existing footprint, they still have to meet the open space requirements, both for usable and landscaped open space. And I haven't seen an analysis that shows um, that they do that. And it, and it sure appears to me that this area of the front yard 
on which the porch will be built qualifies as usable open space. So I would ask, uh, Mr. Chairman, that before your board grant this special permit, that analysis be done to see if one, you're creating a non-conformity with respect to usable open space, or two, you're you know, further um, um, reducing the amount of usable open space if it already is non-conforming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Are there any further questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the, um, the public comment period. And Mr. Roddy raises an interesting point in regards to the usable open space. And just bring that up the package. The analysis was provided as part of the package. Um, I believe there, were, there was a reduction in open space, but I believe it is still conforming, if I recall correctly. Um, so currently, um, so the, the re at the rear yard, the required square yard setback is 18 feet, but currently it's 29.9 from the edge of the porch to the rear yard. And then the is it correct that the full width of the property at the back is available as well? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Table. So currently, so this shows an, an, that the amount of usable open space is increasing on the site. Is that correct? Or is that the, mm. the to the to the point raised by by the. Uh, I mean, already, it certainly would appear that um, while the, the usable open space is being decreased, it's not being, de it is most likely not being decreased anywhere near to the amount um, that would interfere with the ability of the site to um, support the addition. Um, but I, but this, I am curious that it's increased that the usable open space is increasing when. It doesn't. Yeah, I agree. I'm not sure why that. Okay. Apologize. I must. Um, hmm. Are there any further questions from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Relating to Mr. Loretti's comments about uh, section 5.3.9, um, mm -hmm. porches are specifically, are now as a result of action by town meeting, um, would be specifically included in the list of things that could be uh, enlarged by special permit beyond the numerical limits that mm -hmm. were previously uh, in place. Um, it's my understanding that I have not yet seen any indication, and maybe the chair knows more than I do about this, whether the uh, attorney general's office has, <clears throat> has uh, approved the changes that were made by town meeting uh, last time. Uh, if they do, uh, then that would be retroactive and my understanding is that this is supposed to apply in the meantime and it seems to me that the addition of porches to the language I know is intended to make sure that uh, uh, it clarified our power to uh, allow for these extensions by uh, special permit. Thank you Mr. Hanlon. The, I have not heard anything yet um, in regards to determinations by the Attorney General's office, but you are correct that changes to the zoning bylaw um, go into effect upon enactment at town meeting. Um, and so the, the change that was approved by town meeting adds the word um, 
porches into 539A. Uh, so porches and enclosed entrances larger than that allowed above may extend into the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided for the district by special permit. Yes. Um, and that is the, um, the reason that the board is, is able to make this uh, to make this determination and to allow these porches. Um, as such, the porch is an open structure and must remain open and um, should, in the future, should somebody wish to enclose the porch, that now does, under town bylaws, now requires a separate special permit um, at the time that that request is made. So it, the porch cannot be enclosed by right, the porch can only be enclosed by a determination of the board. Um, so should the board wish to move forward with this application, um, we have the three standard conditions, which we have already read into the record. Um, I would also ask that the, um, looking on my cheat sheet here, uh, that the applicant provide revised uh, and signed dimensional and parking information and open space gross floor area sheets, correcting any deficiencies discussed at the hearing um, and to provide that to the director and special services for review. Um, and in this regard, that would be in specifically in relation to the, to the usable open space, to what the current amount of usable open space is on the property and what it will be afterwards. Um, uh, just so that that corrected information is a part of the is a part of the record for this application. Are there any other conditions which the board would wish to impose upon a determination? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So to the point that you just made, when we look at the information that's provided um, with regard to the usable open space. Uh, as percentage in GFA. So in the present conditions, it says 30.81. And is it our belief that that's going to be reduced further? My concern was more in regards to the, well, the line above it with the square footage. Um, so this seems to indicate that the amount of usable open space is going to be increasing. Understood. But if I, I'm just, as I'm reading 18A on that chart, where it says 30.81 mm -hmm. present conditions, and then it's got the 67.34, which we believe is erroneous. But yep. if the minimum is 30, mm -hmm. and the 30.81 is accurate, then does it, does it follow that it's conceivable that that 18A, the, the proposed, is going to fall below the 30 is my question. And if, if so, mm -hmm. don't we have an issue? Mr. Valorelli? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I did a quick calculation. So if I'm looking at the same plot plan um, that has been displayed, I'm coming up with 1,570 square feet of usable open space uninterrupted. That's an area 29.9 times 52.50. Okay. 1,500 square feet will, will uh, satisfy, um, is sufficient enough to satisfy a 5,000 square foot home. Uh, so I have not done the calculation of the structure in the proposed porch, but I would be hard pressed to think that that structure is over 5,000 square feet. Well, certainly on the, the table that's provided to us, uh, let's see, what are we looking at? There's a there's also a plan that indicates that I believe the first floor footprint is of approximately 950 some odd square feet. Um, this lists the proposed gross floor area as pretty much 2100 square feet. So well, well below the 5000 feet, the 5000 square feet. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, 2100. Really. Yeah, uh, 2100 square feet uh, only needs. Um, 630 square feet of usable open space. Okay. In my, according to my calculations, uh, again, with the plot plan mm -hmm. provided, we yep. have 1,570. Yeah. That qualifies. Perfect. Okay. 
So we would just ask that as a as a condition, we would just ask that the applicant um, re just revisit this table here and just double check the numbers and submit a, a revised sheet to the planning to the special services department. Yes, that could be done. Sorry about that. Nope, not at all. Are there any further questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, um, entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the application be approved subject to the standard conditions and the additional condition relating to correction of the record that the chairman just read. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon and Mr. DuPont. So the vote before the board is a motion to approve the special permit application for 101 Robbins Road with the three standard conditions and the one additional condition um, as put forward by Mr. Hanlon and seconded by Mr. DuPont. Are there any questions about what the vote board is voting on? Hmm. Seeing none, let's take a roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, the motion passes. Uh, special permit for 101 Robbins Road is approved. Thank you very much. Appreciate your, your time and your patience with a, a long evening. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Congratulations. Thank you. Have a good night. So this brings item number nine on our agenda. Um, which is docket number 37260 Highland Avenue. Mr. Valorelli, I believe you have received a letter from the applicant in regards to this application. We do, Mr. Chairman. They uh, wish to uh, withdraw. And just to clarify for the board, the reason it's being withdrawn is that um, even though it would qualify as a large addition because of the amount of floor space being added, um, almost all of it is within the existing footprint. And therefore, it does the, this project does not need a determination on large addition by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And therefore, they're requesting that the, their application be withdrawn without prejudice. Um, so with that, uh, they are they request to withdraw the special permit application for 60 Highland Avenue. Uh, without prejudice, may I have a motion to that effect? So moved. Thank second. You. Second by Mr. Dupont. Uh, so this is a vote of the board to withdraw the to allow the withdrawal of the special permit application for 60 Highland Avenue. Um, Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Chair votes aye. That motion is withdrawn. Thank you very much for that. Um, that is the end of the items on our agenda. Um, Mr. Valorelli, do we have hearings scheduled for September at this time? We do, Mr. Chairman. So we have uh, two for September 13th. I'll be getting the documentation out to the board shortly. Okay. Um, only two at this time. Okay. And um, after that, I think we are into October. Okay. Yeah, but for sure, two on September 13th. Perfect. Um, as I had noted to the board in a prior email, um, the, app, the interested parties at uh, 1021, 1027 Massachusetts Avenue um, had a approached the uh, mass housing looking for a letter of project eligibility to uh, qualify for a comprehensive permit uh, for development, a residential development on that property. The mass housing did issue the project eligibility letter. My understanding is that was issued last week. Um, and the applicant is looking to, um, to file for the comprehensive permit uh, within the month. So um, that should probably be filed, I'm guessing, within the next two, three weeks. And at that point, the board will have to open a hearing within 30 days um, in order to, uh, to, to open the hearing. And then once the hearing's open, the board has 180 days to close the hearing. So um, they, had, they had asked, you know, if 
they were already seeking sort of specific dates for uh, when the hearing would be opened. And I just sort of let them know that we would make that determination once the application package is actually in, um, because there, there is a number of things that will need to happen um, on the town side once that application has been filed um, in terms of distributing it to the various town departments um, and then setting up a schedule with the applicant for hearings and things like that. So uh, once we have that application in hand, then we'll have a better sense as to what our timing is gonna be. Um, but for, for those of you who are on the comprehensive permits we did uh, to you know, a year and a half ago, um, usually at the start, there's things sort of go a little bit slow at the start, uh, just to give the time, the town time to catch up with the, what's in the application and that we need to get consultants on hand um, in order to, uh, to fully review the application package. And then as we move forward and we have better information, things will um, sort of heat up a little bit. So we'll sort of see what the, I don't, you know, we don't quite know what the time frame of this is going to be. Obviously, if it, you know, 180 days puts us, you know, half a year out. So um, hopefully by spring, this would be resolved. Um, but, you know, both sides can request continuances um, and extensions if there are, you know, particular circumstances that warrant it. So just to keep that in all of your minds um, that this will be, be happening um, starting this fall and going into the spring, uh, in going into the winter and, you know, hopefully being concluded before the spring. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just wanted to point out to the members of the board who weren't pre previously here that the carefully designed statement that the chair just made is a way of saying, don't count on a skiing vacation this year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am anticipating that this will follow a schedule more closely with, um, uh, with the uh, with the, with the latter one, the, the Artemis project, uh, rather than the Mugar project in terms of a project timeline. Um, so, that, so, okay, so it sounds like we've got two hearings coming up on the 13th, um, possibly none for the 27th. Um, Mr. Hanlon, we approved a wide variety of projects this evening. Um, would you be looking for some assistance in preparing uh, the uh, written determined uh, the written determinations. Sure, I think that would be great. Uh, I've I've already been been working as you may have guessed on the variance one. If I can shed one or two of the uh, other applications, that would uh, <clears throat> that would be helpful. I will I will not put anyone on the spot, but I would. I, I can help you highly to uh, I can help on uh, I can help Mr. on one. Hanlon, I'll be Perfect. Okay, so one of okay. the things to that I think I remember is at least I don't really end, I don't believe that I have a recording that onto my mm -hmm. hard drive that enables me to share. So a first step uh, in all of this, I think, is going to be sort of getting the recording to the cloud accessible to uh, the people writing the opinions. Mm -hmm. I don't actually know how to do that, but I'm sure that other people who are still on the call uh, either know or can readily figure it out, but that'll be the first step. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, I think uh, Mr. Lee is on that. Perfect. And we can have that. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I am. Thanks, Ben. Great. Alrighty. Well, with that, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting, and I especially would like to thank Mr. Valerelli, Mr. Lee, Ms. Linema, and Ms. Lau for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note that the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. And as our understanding, the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zda at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Second.
So moved. Second. And Lennon, seconded by Mr. DuPont. All those in favor of adjournment. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, all you guys. Very Glad everybody. Much. Nice right. job. Nice job. A lot of material. Great job. Thank you. Take care, Thank everyone. you. You too. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, guys.